Um, welcome, everybody. It is wonderful to see you here. I'm looking down at my Zoom to see um, the number of participants, and it's fantastic to see you all. Really a, a wonderful event. I'm Hazel Siv. I'm the relatively new dean of the College of Science at Northeastern. At Northeastern, you're not allowed to call yourself new for very long, and I've been here since June. So I would say I'm sort of not so new, the not so new dean of the College of Science. But um, I want to tell you a couple of things about the college, and I've got one slide that I'm going to show you. I came to Northeastern from MIT, where I was on the faculty for 28 years, and I have a bit of a funny accent because I'm originally from South Africa, but I've been in the United States really all of my professional life. I came to Northeastern because this is a place where anything is possible. At Northeastern, we are inventing the future of the university. And in the College of Science, we can do that together with this amazing power of science that we have. More than ever, science is so incredibly important. If you think about it, without science, we would not know what a coronavirus was. We would have no idea how to detect one, and we would be completely in the dark with regard how to build cures. But we do know, we know because of the science research and the science training that has happened for decades. And because of that, we are well on our way to finding cures, including with the contributions at Northeastern and including with the extraordinary effort that Northeastern has made this semester to keep our community safe, to test our community, and to think about how coronavirus can be contained to allow our university to continue in a vibrant and important way. And to date, we are doing very well. And I am so glad and so proud to be part of this university that is doing, I, in my opinion, better than any other university to keep its students and its community, its faculty and staff safe. I um, tell you a couple of things. The College of Science is really a fantastic place at Northeastern. We are solving problems that are the greatest challenges on our planet. We are training the next generation of top students who will have the problem solving skills, the knowledge skills, and the personal skills, the confidence and the ability to communicate, skills that allow them to move into the next stages of their careers, whether they're educational stages or jobs, these skills are so valuable. Our students do incredibly well as they go forward. It is this coalescence of education and research that is just a wonderful thing about our college and indeed about universities. And I wanted to show you, a, I'm gonna share my screen for a single slide, but I wanted to show you a kind of notion that I have in thinking about how we think about ourselves. So when we think about our college, and indeed universities, but this is about our college today, there is this wonderful set of positive loops that promote everything one to another. Our research effort, which is so strong, is promoting education of our students to understand the frontiers of science, to learn how to become researchers themselves and contribute in many different ways in many professions. Our education drives our research. Our education drives innovators. Many of our faculty and students are innovators or entrepreneurs who go on to make patents and startup companies. And in turn, that innovation drives our research. So there is this fantastic set of positive feedback loops that guides the power and excellence of our college. But I will tell you that science is aspirational. You are never satisfied, and indeed you should not be satisfied, or things do not stay excellent. Our college has to aspire to become even more excellent, ever more excellent. And 
you indeed, our audience, our, our attendees here today, are part of the aspiration to promote our power and our excellence. When we think about our college, there's another metric that I'm going to put on top of my slide, and that is that we do everything within a culture of respect and equity. And we are, con we are committed across our college to respect each person and the value that each person brings and to promote equity across our college. So that is a slide that I wanted to share with you. I'll leave it up for a moment so that you can see these um, wonderful positive loops that um, inspire me and I think are a framework for thinking about our college. I am so delighted to welcome you to our first College of Science Connects seminar. This is a way that we are connecting with you to bring to you the extraordinary excellence, the scholarship, the research of our faculty, particularly our more junior faculty, so that you can see what is going on in the college and understand the um, awesomeness of the, um, the work that is going on here. I want to say to each of you, whether you are an alum, a parent, a friend, you are an incredibly important part of our community. As part of our Northeastern College of Science community, you are pivotal in your support and your friendship. You are pivotal in helping us move forward, new programs, education, research, and innovation. And we are so glad to have you as part of the Northeastern College of Science community really now and forever. So I welcome you today and I'm going to unshare my slide here. There we go. I welcome you here today. It is just um, outstanding to have you all with us and I am so delighted now to feature today and to pass on this um, duty of, of speaking with you or this pleasure of speaking with you. I am so honored today that we are featuring our psychology department in the College of Science. The health of the human mind is something that is never far from our thoughts. It is probably the thing that keeps us thinking about ourselves in the most concerned way all the time. The human mind is something that is mysterious and powerful and so incredibly important for human health as a whole. Our psychology department is top ranked and our investigator, Rebecca Shansky, Professor Rebecca Shansky, who is being featured today, is a star amongst our junior faculty and across the world. So it is my great honor and pleasure to pass this mic on, figuratively speaking, to the chair of our psychology department, Professor Peter Bex, who will welcome you further and introduce Professor Shansky. Pete? Thank you, Hazel, and thanks for those inspiring words. Um, and thanks to everyone who's joining us this morning. It's my very great pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague, Dr. Rebecca Shansky, uh, as the inaugural speaker of the College of Science Connect series. Dr. Sansky is an associate professor in the Department of Psychology, where she directs the Laboratory of Neuroanatomy and Behavior. Dr. Sansky received her PhD in Neurobiology from Yale University in 2004. And this was followed by six years as a postdoctoral research fellow at the Department of Neuroscience in Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. She joined the De Department of Psychology at Northeastern University in 2011 as a, an assistant professor and was promoted to associate professor in 2017. Dr. Shansky's lab uses rodent models to explore the links between brain structure and function. Her research focuses on how, <clears throat> on how individual differences in cortical circuit responses to fear and stress shape long-term behavior and memory formation. This work aims to identify biomarkers for vulnerability and resilience, which have important public health translational impact. She has secured six major awards from the National Institute of Mental Health of NIH to support this work. One aspect of Dr. Shansky's research that distinguishes her work from others in her field is her pioneering focus on sex differences in neurobiology. 
The dominant use of animal models in, uh, in research prior to 2016 ignores significant differences in male and female neurobiology and risks a failure of personalized medicine approaches. You can learn more about this work from her book uh, titled Sex Differences in the Central Nervous System, published by Elsevier in 2016. Dr. Shansky has been a vocal advocate for gender and sex equity in experimental design, and her expertise has drawn wide reaching public attention. In particular, a 2019 article in Science titled, Are Hormones a Female Problem for Animal Research? was featured in mainstream media outlets, including the New York Times and Science Friday on NPR. Dr. Shansky's research and opinions are therefore capturing broad uh, interest as attested by the 63 national and international seminars and colloquia that she has been invited to give since joining Northeastern University. One of Dr. Shansky's most prestigious and exciting speaking engagements was in Gabaron, Botswana at the Mind and Life Institute of Dialogue with the Dalai Lama. So we are therefore in distinguished company in hearing about her research today. And I invite you all to welcome uh, my colleague, Dr. Rebecca Shansky. Uh, thank you, Hazel and Pete, for that introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm just going to share my screen quickly so I can um, get going. Okay. Um, so I am, again, very honored to be the inaugural presenter for this, um, for this really exciting series that I think is going to be fantastic as we go through the semester. Um, and I'm really excited to specifically tell you about some of the work we've been doing in my lab, as well as some of the broader issues that really motivate everything we do um, in our research. And so um, one of the things that we think about in the lab is that every experience you have um, shapes who you are as a person. And that happens through a mechanism that we um, kind of generally call neuroplasticity. And you've probably seen in news articles that um, all kinds of things change your brain. And so uh, walking in nature can change your brain, practicing mindfulness, exercise, parenting, um, all the food you eat, um, reading, and even God. Um, and I don't have a, a screenshot for this, but I think what we are learning is that um, uh, coronavirus can also change your brain and certainly the experiences that we're having in, um, in quarantine and lockdown will have long-term effects. And so um, all of this is what we, um, what we call neuroplasticity. And it is essentially the broad goal of neuroscientists to try and understand how neuroplasticity contributes to the development of psychiatric and neurological disorders. And so we do research in the laboratory, um, very often using, um, using animals as our research subjects, but we have a little bit of an embarrassing secret. And what I mean by that is that when we talk about the brain or, you know, in all of the uh, article titles I just showed you, what we really mean is, is male brains. Um, at, we don't study male and female brains at the same rate. In fact, neuroscientists uh, who use animals in the laboratory study male animals almost six times as much as they study females. And this is going to be a public health problem. It is already. Um, and so one of the reasons that this is so important to think about is that mental illnesses and neurological disorders occur in everyone. There are very, very few, um, there are very few mental illnesses or neurological disorders that only occur in men or women. They occur in everyone, but uh, which means that we need to be able to treat everyone for these disorders. Um, but what we also can see is that they affect men and women differently um, or at different rates. So what you're looking at in this 
um, this chart on the left here is the incidence ratio of some very common mental illnesses um, in women versus men. And what you can see up at the top here, um, disorders like PTSD, panic disorder, anxiety disorder, and major depressive disorder are all at least twice as common in women as they are in men. And so what this suggests is that there may be a unique neurobiological mechanism um, with, uh, that is different between male and female brains that makes women more susceptible to developing these kinds of disorders. Um, but if we're not studying female brains in the laboratory, we're not gonna understand what that susceptibility mechanism might be. And so you may ask yourself, well, why doesn't, why don't we study females? And if you ask neuroscientists who uh, historically have studied male animals, why they won't study females, um, the answer is hormones. Look at these crazy hormones. Um, what I'm showing you here on the left are plots of hormonal changes across um, the rodent estrous cycle and the human menstrual cycle. And you can see that um, in both women and, um, and female rats, we can see that uh, hormones like estradiol, progesterone have periods of being up and down. And the logic there is that well, you might have some females that are in this high phase of, um, of hormones and some that are in low. And so our data are gonna be so messy because we've got all these crazy hormones. Um, and that to me is not a good excuse because I think that um, having fluctuating hormones is a normal part of the biology of being um, a female organism. And that's something that we should just sort of take as a given for how, um, for how female bodies and brains work. In addition, uh, male hormones will vary too, especially in mice. Um, so if you place mice in a cage together, which is normally how they're housed in, uh, in a lab, you usually put four or five animals together, they will establish a dominance hierarchy. And the testosterone levels in the alpha male are, uh, can be up to 10 times as high as the testosterone levels in the, uh, the subordinate animals. And so here's this source of, vari of hormonal variability that has, exists in you know, every laboratory across the world. And somehow this hormone variability has not been seen as troubling as hormone variability in female animals is. And so to me, that's a double standard that is unacceptable when we are trying to understand how brains work. And so the general philosophy of my lab is that we need to treat hormone variability in both sexes just as a natural part of the brain's physiology. This is how things are supposed to work, um, and they do when we can study brain function against that backdrop instead of seeing it as something that needs to be controlled or accounted for when we do our experiments. The other thing that um, I think is really important that I, I've been working to try and um, convince my colleagues and neuroscientists in general of is that female animals are just as useful research subjects as, um, as males are in, in terms of just basic science understanding brain function. And so we're making some progress on that, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, so. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how uh, we've been working to get at some of these questions. And so one of the main questions we have in my lab is, is the relationship between neural structure and function different in males and females? Can we identify points where structure is differently meaningful um, in males and females? And what you're looking at here is a um, photo that my grad student took on a microscope of one uh, neuron in an area of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. And this is an area of the brain that is responsible for emotion regulation. And so we're really interested in how uh, this area of the brain is, um, is different in just sort of individual uh, variability in terms of emotion regulation success. 
Um, and so what we do is we can take these pictures of, um, of these neurons that have been filled with a fluorescent dye. And um, I'll show you a cool little video here. So we can take these images in 3D and examine all of the, um, the structure of the neuron. You can see here there's lots of dendrites. These are essentially the neurons antenna. They, these are what are re, uh, receiving information from other parts of the brain, from neighboring neurons within the brain. Um, and we can learn a lot about the ability of this brain region to, um, to mediate and regulate emotion based on this information. This is a really zoomed in um, picture of just a little snippet of, of one of these dendrites. And all of those little protrusions, those are spines, those are called spines, and those are the sites of synaptic input. So again, this is where, this is where all the magic happens um, on a neuron is at these spines. And we can use computer software to understand um, how these, uh, these spines change in response to experiences that the animals have. And so again, it's this question of neuroplasticity. These spines are not permanent. They um, can grow and go away as the animal moves through its, through its life. And so uh, I, we mentioned that the title of the talk that we're really interested in fear behavior and that's because I'm really interested in one of those statistics I mentioned which is that women are twice as likely to develop PTSD as males are and we use a paradigm called Pavlovian fear conditioning and so this is a pretty classical associative learning task in which the animal hears a, a tone come out of a little speaker in the box and as soon as the tone ends it gets a little foot shock in, um, in its in the floor. And so then soon the animal starts to become afraid of the tone because it knows the tone means it's going to um, it's going to get a foot shock, which it doesn't like. And so what we've been interested in is looking at individual differences in the way these animals learn that association. Um, and how we are able to judge those individual differences is in the way they express that fear response once they've learned the association. And so animals that exhibit a big fear response may have learned better than animals that have a, a smaller um, fear response. And so this paradigm is really old. It was developed um, sort of in the early 20th century and the people who developed it and everyone who's been using it in labs around the world for the last multiple, multiple decades um, have, de have decided essentially that the way we measure how much an animal learned is in the amount of time it spends in a freezing posture. So you can see this rat here is demonstrating the freezing response. You can think of it as kind of a deer in the headlights kind of response where the animal just completely stops moving. And it's thought that this is an expression of um, vigilance as well as a um, desire not to be detected by a potential predator. And so what we did when I first started the lab was we did an experiment where we, um, we measured this fear conditioned freezing in males and females, and then we looked at their neurons in, um, in the prefrontal cortex, that area that I mentioned before. And what we found was that if we compared high freezing and low freezing males, their neurons were different from each other. So there was essentially this structural signature of um, what we were interpreting as good and bad learning. Um, but when we looked at the females, we didn't have that, that distinction in, um, in their neurons. The high freezing and low freezing females kind of all at the same. And so we were pretty puzzled by this, uh, this difference and we asked ourselves, what are we missing? And so instead of looking into the neural structure, we went back to the videos of the animals behaving in this task. And what we found was that Yes, the males were exhibiting this freezing response and the animals that counted as the low freezers, they uh, were just not really doing much of anything. Um, they were just kind of walking around the cage and it really seemed like they didn't really understand what the tone meant. But in the females, when we looked at our low freezing females who 
theoretically did not learn, um, we saw they were doing something else. Instead of freezing, they were engaging in this darting behavior where they heard the tone and they started to run around the cage like they were trying to escape. And this was something that under normal um, data collection practices, we would have just ruled out as a lack of fear or a lack of learning. And what became clear was that these animals did learn and they were afraid they were just expressing it differently. And this was something that, again, we saw really just in the females. And so we've become really interested in understanding what uh, is the behavioral repertoire we have in females and what, do we, what can we look at in, um, uh, in these animals. And you can see here this animal, the tone has come on and she sort of spun around, she ran to the other, end, uh, other side of, um, of the chamber. She will engage in a little bit of, um, of freezing behavior right here. So you can see she's completely not moving at all. Um, and then she's gonna kind of creep out to see if maybe it's safe to, uh, to emerge. Um, so this is a, a pretty common contrast to what we see in the males, which is basically they just freeze. Um, and so what we are trying to understand now um, are a, a bunch of different things about this behavior. So first of all, we want to know what is darting. Is it a true escape response? Could it possibly mean something else? And why do we only see it in females? Um, and so some of the things that we are really excited that we're kind of just getting going on now in the lab is to use viral strategies to selectively activate or silence neural circuits. So what we've identified is, again, a role for this area of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, and specifically the projections, the connectivity it has with a part, another part of the brain deep down in the brain stem called the periaqueductal gray. We think that's the circuit that's controlling darting. And so we have some really exciting state-of-the-art tools that will allow us to selectively um, either activate or silence the circuit. And that's going to allow us to see whether we can increase darting or suppress darting, whether we can turn males into darters by doing this. Um, and the other thing we really want to know is, is that neuroplasticity different in darters versus freezers? So are darters learning something new about their environment that's different from animals that only engage in freezing? How can we see how does this change the circuitry? How does this change the brain in a long-term um, kind of way? So there's a lot that we can do in the lab to really try and probe uh, this response, the sex differences within it um, at a very exciting cellular level. Uh, the other fun thing we have going on is a collaboration with a colleague of mine, uh, Bob Data at Harvard Medical School, who has developed a really sophisticated tool that uses machine learning to identify novel behavior patterns. And so this uses uh, a camera that can measure the animal's position in space, so not just where it is um, in two dimensions, but in three dimensions. And the uh, machine learning aspect of it, it essentially breaks behavior down into what they're calling syllables and then can identify syllable patterns that uh, will show us things that maybe we can't see with, uh, with just the human eye, but that are really there distinguishing these subgroups of animals that may help us ultimately understand what it means to be susceptible or resilient against um, aversive experiences. So we're really excited to use this tool as well. Um, and so just to kind of wrap things up here, why is all of this so important? Well, it's because basic science is there in a lot of ways to inform clinical developments. And so the use of male animals over the course of um, the last 60, 70 years, however you know, long NIH has been around, um, has essentially led to tunnel vision in the development of therapeutics because we are using these behavioral outcomes that were developed in male animals as the, the benchmark as to whether or not, for example, a particular drug works. Um, but if we're not even looking for the right behavioral outcomes, if we're trying to treat females, then we could be um, missing you know, a potentially new drugs, or whether they may there may be um, aversive side effects in um, specifically in women. So there are 
um, a lot of reasons that I think neuroscientists need to start studying both males and females and not simply judging females using the frameworks that were developed in males. So I will stop there. Um, I wanted to thank my amazing lab without whom none of this would have been possible. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions if people have them. Becca, thank you so much for that talk, which was truly outstanding. Really, it's uh, <laughs> I am so struck by the um, difficulty of doing top research as a as a researcher myself. The effort and the the intellectual power and the work that goes into this um, scholarship that you've shared with us is just extraordinary. It is really so important and it is so wonderful to hear your discussion. Let me um, take some questions from the, I think we're doing this from the chat, I believe. Is that right, Diana? We're doing questions from the chat? Yes. Okay, so please, you know, whatever questions you have, um, please put them in the chat and I will encourage you what I encouraged the entire College of Science, I think last week, well, the week before last, I send a weekly update every week. I said to them, I shared the time that a Nobel laureate asked me questions that I thought were pretty um, basic questions. And I realized that if you need to know the answer to something, you just ask. So please just ask your question. Don't worry if you think it's um, a stupid question. There is no such thing. There are just questions. So please um, ask um, Professor Shansky anything that you want about the research that she's described or indeed something else on your mind that you think um, she might be able to answer for you. I see a question um, that asks, how do you think we develop a more holistic behavioral evaluation for fear behavior that incorporates darting and other fear responses? Um, so fantastic question. I, you know, I think that this is really where the machine learning tool will come in because the, the way the machine learning works is that it, you don't decide in advance what you're looking for. The, um, the computer tells you what you're seeing. Um, and so I think in that sense, we have these really high throughput, um, sophisticated computational ways of identifying these novel behaviors that we don't, that don't allow us to anthropomorphize, that don't necessarily um, allow us to rule out things that we don't, we don't might not think are important that could turn out to be important. So I think that um, that this is really the, the way forward on all of this. Thank you. Thank you, Becca. Here's another, some fa fabulous questions, everybody. Just keep typing away and um, we'll answer as many as possible in our time. We have quite a bit of time for discussion and questions, which is great. Um, are funding organizations moving towards requiring both female and male animal models? Um, so the answer to that is yes. Uh, NIH, at least, has uh, put in place a, a mandate that started in 2016 called Considering Sex as a Biological Variable. And it's taken a little while to get off the ground, but basically what it means is that when researchers apply for funding from NIH, they need to say that they are going to use male and, both male and female animals in their research. And so that caused quite a big hubbub in, um, you know, in the field, which is why I wrote that piece um, in science last year, because people were worried that, um, that being required to use female animals meant that they had to study the estrus cycle, which is not true, um, unless you want to, of course, which there is a whole field for that. It's called neuroendocrinology, um, and it is the study of how hormones affect the brain. Um, but not everybody has to be a neuroendocrinologist. Um, NSF, to my knowledge, does not require um, using both males and females, but certainly I think the the winds are changing on this and people are starting to understand why it is so important to um, to study both. Yes, outstanding. Um, 
you know, you talked about um, the prefrontal cortex being monitored in your darting studies, and there are questions about um, what about other brain regions? Is it just, do you think that that is the major part of the brain that's important here, or do you think there are other parts of the brain that you could study and um, get valuable data from? Sure. So, um, so yes, yeah, so no brain region works in isolation, right? Everything is connected, and one of the big things that neuroscience has really been focusing on lately because we have the tools to do these manipulations are neural circuits. So um, as I mentioned in the talk, we're focused on projections from the prefrontal cortex to the periaqueductal gray. And the reason this is such a cool circuit is that there are actually two circuits. So in the periaqueductal gray, it's got one part that controls that if you just stimulate it, uh, elicits essentially a darting response and one part that if you stimulate it, it elicits uh, um, a freezing response. And so those two parts of the periaqueductal gray receive separate neuroanatomical input from the prefrontal cortex. And so the way we're thinking about this is that the prefrontal cortex can essentially act as a, as a switch to decide whether you're going to have a freezing response or a darting response. And what we think might be happening is that the strength of um, those, two, those two prefrontal circuits might determine whether you become a darter or a freezer. Thank you, Becca. You know, I'm so struck by the complexity of this brain <laughs> you're talking about as someone who studies the development of the brain, you know, and has taught about the brain, the notion of a brain with, you know, 10 to the, with, with trillions and trillions, with a thousand trillion connections between its cells makes uncovering these circuits um, so incredibly complex. And I think your work is going um, a long way to de convoluting this enormous complexity of the brain. Um, it's so important. I'm going to um, jump around a little bit. There's some great questions here, but I want to go to some of perhaps the more provocative questions here. So let's um, go to those because those are interesting to discuss. Here's one. To what degree do you suppose that the way we study male and female brains is influenced by our cultural perspectives? Um, great question. And I actually think that it is influenced quite a bit by our cultural perspectives. Um, I think that the basic culture within neuroscience has been that if you want to understand the fundamental aspects of neurobiology, you study male brains because they're cleaner, because they don't have the influence of circulating hormones. And that if you are a person who wants to study female brains, it's because you're specifically interested in women's health, not neuroscience. Mm -hmm. um, and so that I think is a is really problematic because it essentially treats males as like the default um, and that females are this sort of like unique weird deviation from, um, from that. And some of the research that I did um, when I was putting together the, um, the science piece last year revealed that those perspectives are actually long-standing cultural stereotypes that were put in place um, around the Victorian era. Um, and the, the idea was that before then, the bi like view from biologists was that women were sort of like an inferior version of men. And that became a little like on PC. And so they had to restructure their narrative to essentially give women their these like unique qualities um, and so they gave them sensitivity perceptiveness emotionality etc and said okay so you have your own thing going on you're not just like a different version of men but uh these qualities clearly make you unsuited for societal leadership and the goal was essentially to preserve the patriarchy. And so that has been how we view culturally the differences between women and men um, for over a hundred years. And that I think has kind of infiltrated the way that scientists think about how to do objective neuroscience research. And the, the result has been we study males because they are true and real and females 
have all these crazy hormones that are getting in the way of what's really going on when of course they are a part of what's going on in the first place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that's a, a great answer to this um, question. There's a, there's a number of them that are sort of along these lines. So let me um, try to paraphrase a couple. Um, one is very specific to ask whether there are correlations between hormones and fear conditioning performance. For example, are high testosterone males better or worse fear conditioning performance? Great question. So we've looked into that a little bit, not on the male side though. So we haven't done, um, I mean, so this is sort of like the whole idea of what I was talking about is no one except for people who are really specifically interested in male hormones even bothers to look at whether or not your male animals have high versus low testosterone. Whereas if you're studying females, it can be um, pretty common to look at what stage of the ester cycle they're in to see whether or not they have um, high versus low estradiol. So off the top of my head, I don't know anyone who has done that male experiment to really separate the animals out by low versus high testosterone. In females, having high versus low estrogen doesn't seem to affect fear conditioning itself. It can affect some other learning processes that um, kind of happen down the line, but, um, but to, for in our lab, we don't see an effect of, um, of hormones on fear conditioning learning or on darting, by the way, we looked at that too. Right, right. Good. Um, okay, so let me see if I can bring a couple of questions together. There, there's a question about, you know, along the lines of the societal question and the cultural question of why we've sort of ignored the difference um, between male and female behavior and brains. Um, there's the question of, you know, why um, this was all so ignored, even though it was clear that there were different hormones that were of neurobehavioral significance. So, so that's sort of a, a more along the lines of this cultural question of why um, these differences, these, these um, sex differences were not studied. But then I'm going to segue it into another really um, important, interesting question, which is the sense that, you know, the two gender idea in our social climate is really changing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, how do you think um, incorporating sex differences into research is balanced with the notion that there is a challenge to two gender ideas. So, so I've, I've kind of convoluted two questions. I hope you will forgive me, um, <laughs> <laughs> Elena and Andy, um, they're on the chat there, but I thought there was a very interesting way of putting this together. You know, so why was this all ignored for, for so long when we knew about hormonal differences um, in neurobehavior and how do these differences now segue into this notion, into this challenge of a two gender model. Does that work for you, Becker? I kind of. No, I'm gonna. I'm gonna do my, do my best on this. Um, I think the you know again, I think it does come back to these these sort of implicit as to what we think makes a um, you know a male rat, a male rat, and what makes a female rat a female rat. And there is this cultural influence on this idea that the female, or, or, you know, circulating ovarian reproductive hormones are really, really, are, are like the primary driver of female psychology and behavior and neuroscience in general. And that like, there just isn't quite that link with respect to um, male animals and testosterone. And I think that that is a cultural influence in the way we think about things because for sure, testosterone has all kinds of effects on, um, on brain function and the fact that it might be a variable influencing basic science research in male animals is, um, has just been ignored um, because we think it's just sort of normal. Um, whereas female hormonal fluctuations are uh, messy. Um, and so 
I, you know, I, it's not that there's no one studying them, but it isn't seen as a primary concern in basic neuroscience research. Uh, this question about uh, sex differences versus gender, uh, understanding all the different genders that there exist in humans is something that I, I do struggle with a lot because I, um, I want to, to show appreciation that talking about this in sort of a binary way at the level of my research and trying to apply that to humans is not a straight, you know, kind of one-to-one -one thing. What I think is important here is that in studying, you know, so we can't assign a gender to a rat because we can't ask it how it identifies. And so the best we can do at, the, at this level is to, um, is to, you know, to at least study both male and female rodents. What I think that will do in terms of translational research that is going to reach the public um, is not necessarily to say, well, the results in males are going to translate to men and the results in females are going to translate to the women and there's nothing we can do for, um, you know, for people whose identity is, um, is not, is non-binary. And so, what I will say, though, is that studying at the basic science level, male and female brains will, at the very least, broaden the scope of what we understand is possible within a brain. Um, we can identify new mechanisms based on the sex differences that we observe. And it's not necessarily guaranteed that everything we learn, um, everything we knew in males is going to, you know, go in one direction, everything is going to, in females is going to go in another direction once you translate up to humans, but it gives us some more options. It widens the, um, you know, the scope of what we can observe and it might be able uh, to help us understand just basically what's available to human brains um, as possible and it doesn't have to be this strict one-to-one -one translation. Very interesting, very interesting. And, 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 um, and Andy notes, if the binary system of gender is dismissed, you're kind of starting completely from scratch in many ways, which um, may be one of the powers of animal models in that you can actually look at the data and you can look at the um, parameters that you have rather than um, starting from something other than actual molecules perhaps um, exactly. that, that we have to do in humans. So this is very interesting and of course one of the great powers of using animal models for addressing such complex questions um, as human brain health. Let's see, um, let, let me see what else. Um, there's a question about rodent strains and mm -hmm. what a very specific question in that in our research on animal models we use so many, um, we use defined to, tr to try to understand things, we tend to use very clear defined systems. But of course, there are many different um, strains of animals that you could use that are a bit different from one another. Um, have you looked at those and do you see differences between them? And how would you interpret so, that? The primary strain of rat that we use in the lab is called a spray dolly. Um, these are the white albino rats that um, you saw in the, the freezing picture I showed. Um, we also use Long Evans rats, which are a different strain, and they definitely have some different behavioral um, idiosyncrasies uh, to these uh, compared to the Sprague dollies. And so we haven't seen as much darting in the Long Evans as we do in the Sprague dollies. So there may be a little bit of a strain difference there. Um, but we just, we haven't the rats that we're using long ovens for, we're not using for a darting study, so we haven't really like dug in um, with them yet. Very interesting. You, you will not know this, but for a while, I was a high school biology teacher in England, and my students kept rats as pets there, and they would, <laughs> they would have rat races. They were very sweet. You know, rats are, I think, are very, oh, yeah, very sweet animals. Very um, and they would have rat races um, over recess time. And there would be the rats running all over the desk. I have no idea what strain they were, but it was, it's, uh, 
reminds me. Okay, so here's a very interesting question um, that has to do with whether your discoveries in sex of sex differences in animal behaviors have implications for other CNS diseases with gender biases such as Alzheimer's or, um, you know, one could even put in their autism, which has a very preponderant um, sex difference. Yeah. Sure. So I think, so the fear conditioning paradigm itself, I think, doesn't necessarily apply to um, Alzheimer's or, um, or autism, but the study of sex differences and the mechanisms and in the behavioral phenotypes of these disorders is something that's really, really important to study. Um, I have a colleague at the University of Minnesota named Nicola Grissom, who is an amazing scientist, and she studies sex differences in autism models and in um, decision making and, um, and other kinds of learning patterns. And she sees that male and female, that she studies mice, not rats, but they essentially have different strategies when they're working on complex problems. And they can all, they can both get to the end, but just like we see in my research, if you're using one kind of um, a parameter set as what the right way to do something is, you're going to miss what the you make miss what the other animal, the other sex of the animal is doing. Um, and so it again, she sort of um, uncovered these biases in the way that behavioral experiments are designed and interpreted in neuroscience research that is really going to, I think, open up a lot of different ways that we can understand how these processes work. Outstanding. So a lot of questions here, and I can see we're going to run out of time, but that is always wonderful. And I'll pass these questions on to you, Becca, and, and you can okay. see them. Um, if there's a way you can answer them afterwards. Um, here's an interesting one. You know, what would your experiments do to evaluating effectiveness of various FDA approved medications for depression and other things that may have sex differences? Um, how do you see, in other words, the translational significance of what you're studying? Sure, so what we see in our, um, in darter. So the way we're thinking about it is that it's essentially, you could think of it as like an active versus a passive response to a threat. And you can see in human populations that uh, people who undergo some kind of traumatic event and who have a more passive response during the event, either they, you know, they themselves freeze or they go into what's called a, um, a dissociative um, traumatic dissociative fugue, they are more likely to develop PTSD afterwards. Um, and so what we can see is if we can find, for example, drugs that increase the likelihood that animals will switch into that darting mode, that's one way that we could, uh, we might envision being able to apply this to humans who we know are going to be in traumatic, uh, uh, traumatic experiences like, uh, um, combat veteran or combat soldiers, firefighters, um, people like that. So those are, that's one, um, you know, one sort of low hanging fruit, I think of this. Um, but I think on a, a deeper level, it's going to help us understand learning and the neuroplasticity that underlies learning. And if we can find mechanisms that are unique to, um, to one behavior versus another, then we can also try and get in there, find novel targets, um, or try and understand even how behavioral manipulations that lead to darting versus freezing could also um, promote one, one outcome versus the other. Outstanding, outstanding, very, very encouraging. Um, let's see, there's a, there's a number of interesting questions here. I'm going to throw them out and, and Becca, you can decide which one you want to answer here. Okay. And I, I know I've ignored something about, um, um, there's a question from a new graduate student. I'm just going to deflect that one. Not that it is not a fabulous question, but it's kind of a long one, but I see, um, there's a question about being a woman in science in a male dominated field and how you feel about that. There's a question about using rat models rather than mice. And there's a question about machine learning algorithms and which ones um, would be best for your research. So I'm giving you here three questions, the rats versus mice. <laughs> <laughs> the woman in science question and the machine learning algorithms question. So you pick 
maybe one of them because then we'll need to finish up. Oh my gosh. Um, okay. Well, I or think all three, I, whatever you want. Uh, then, okay, I'll do, do, I mean, I think good. some of them I can answer the two sort of procedural ones I can answer really quickly. And then hopefully I can take a little more time with the other one. So we're using rats more than mice um, because rats have a bigger prefrontal cortex. So there's a little more going on there and that's what we like to study. But it's true that mice have more um, uh, transgenic opportunities. So we may do both eventually. Um, as far as machine learning al algorithms go, this one tool that we are using is called motion sequencing. It's by far the best out there. Um, there are a lot where you define the, um, the things that you want it to look for, and that makes the data collection automated, but this one really tells you what you're seeing, and I think that that's the best. Um, so being a woman in science in a male-dominated field um, has been uh, an experience. I think it's very common across biological sciences. Um, I was very lucky in grad school to have several really amazing um, female mentors and role models to look up to. And so that just seeing that there are um, really excellent women who can, you know, are making it work is inspiring and, um, and makes me want to continue. Um, definitely the more I studied sex differences specifically, the more I started to recognize the biases in, um, you know, built into the way we conduct research in the first place. And that's something that as I moved through my career, uh, especially as a professor here, and especially after NIH introduced the sex as a biological variable, um, which was something I had already been working on and already been thinking about, suddenly I was kind of bumped into this like expert uh, position that um, I didn't expect and that um, um, all of a sudden everyone is interested in doing sex differences research or at least they're, they want to know how um, to do it in the best way possible. And so, you know, I, I have, my feeling has always just been like, just keep going with the with the flow and I think things are changing for the better for women in science probably not as fast as they need to be because there's still a lot of um, biases there are studies out there showing that women's grants are not scored as well as men's are even once you take out quality of the science type things so um, there's still a lot of work to be done Terrific. So there certainly is, Becca, and I resonate with that, and it's a fantastic discussion to have. This has been just an extraordinary time to spend with you all. Um, um, I want to thank you, Becca, Professor Shansky, for sharing your scholarship, your thoughts, and your insights with us today. Really, what a valuable time to um, have the honor of spending with you. I want to thank you, um, Professor Pete Becks, for sharing your time with us and introducing um, Professor Shansky, I want to thank all of you for joining us for this first College of Science Connects seminar. We have these regularly. We want you to be part of our regular audience. We are so honored and pleased to have you as alumni, as parents and friends, as part of our Northeastern College of Science community. I personally look forward to connecting with you going forward and to working with you to make our College of Science ever more excellent. Thank you so much, and I wish you all a wonderful day.